Hey there. Today we're going to talk a little bit about theories of personality. All right. So it's interesting stuff. First question is, of course, what is personality? And so we can get a definition, you know, and a, a unique constellation, <laughs> a unique combination of characteristics, etc. But a, a durable disposition. Anyway, personality really allows prediction. That is to say, if somebody is extroverted, and we'll talk more about extroverted and introverted later, but it allows us to predict something about their behavior. So people that are extroverted tend to talk at parties. Okay? So that is really what personality studying is about, is to help us to understand human behavior in a variety of contexts. So what kinds of things can create personality? All right. So first thing is, is personality is sort of understood in some ways. And we're going to look at a variety of factors, uh, factors, theories, theories of personalities. And when I say theories of personalities, I mean potentially the way we think about what personality is and the way we think about where personality comes from. Okay, so we're going to be looking at some of these. But anyway, the big five um, factors in personality, there's been a lot of research done, and it turns out that everywhere around the world, this seems to be a, a universal construct, that these five factors, and often um, they're abbreviated OCEAN, O-C-E-A-N, for um, open, and these are out of order here, but openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, neuroticism, and every human being, it's almost like um, you could describe the personality of any human being on the planet if you just describe them across these five dimensions. So you can see for each of these, it's under my head here, but as you can see for each of these five factors, that conscientiousness, that you might... Um, fall along some kind of a continuum between perhaps organized and disorganized, or careful and careless, or disciplined and impulsive. I don't know, different ways to exactly think about it. But by putting yourself along, you know, these five, someplace along these five dimensions, you can sort of accurately describe a person and understand who they are. Now, don't get me wrong, there are huge cultural differences. Say, for example, um, people in America tend to be much higher in extroversion than people from Asian nations, for example. But it doesn't change the fact that you can describe either an American or an Asian person as some combination of these five factors. Okay? So, one of the original theories of personality... Um, comes from Sigmund Freud, and we call these psychodynamic. We're going to talk about psychotherapy. Um, I think it might be all the way up to topic 14 or 15, somewhere towards the end. But we're going to talk about, first off, where does personality come from, and then later we're going to talk about psychotherapy as a technique, of, uh, you know, a therapeutic technique for fixing mental illness. But anyway, here's, here's where Freud's conception comes from. And by the way, I got a problem with Freud. I'm not kidding you. Oh, Freud and I. But here it goes. So when an infant is born, they only have one part to their personality structure, and that's the id. And the id is a person, part of a personality structure that is that is driven by nothing but instinctive urges, instinctual urges, uh, and, and they are both selfish and impulsive. It is gimme, gimme, gimme now, okay? So it's, it's driven by what they call the pleasure principle. And so the it is driven by give me and give me now. So it is both, as I said, impulsive and selfish. But then later on, what happens is the infant or young, young child begins to interact with the world around them and finds that these instinctive urges don't always match well with the reality that they're living in. Okay, so the ego is the second part of the personality to develop, and the ego's job is to operate well on the reality principle. That is to say, um, I know that you want to eat and you're hungry, but here's the thing. So if a baby's hungry, they their id says, I'm hungry, and they scream. Okay, but the ego puts the, the, the id in, well, puts the, the personality in check with reality and says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If I'm hungry and there's no one in the room, screaming doesn't do anything, right? So 
how about this, Id? I know that you're hungry, but let's just wait on that screaming thing until there's actually someone around to hear it, okay? So the ego's job is to put it in touch with reality, the practicalities of it. And we're going to talk at some point about ego strength and ego depletion because it's a pretty cool model for some other decision-making work that I work with. But the ego is in charge of reality. Then what happens is later on, hopefully, a child will develop a third part of their morality, uh, their, their personality. So, the well, in fact, stepping back, the ego's job is to essentially regulate the impulsive nature of the id. Okay? So as we said, the ego said, yes, id, I understand that you're hungry, but you got to wait because there's nobody in the room. Okay? Well, the id is still selfish. Okay? It's just perhaps the ego regulates the impulsive nature. So later on along comes a superego, and the superego's job is to sort of, you know, start to incorporate a social world into the, the personality to recognize that, it, that, that, that the individual does not exist in isolation. And so the ego, the superego's job is to sort of be a moral component or uh, bringing in other standards. In other words, the id's uh, selfish nature. So the superego's job is to sort of regulate the selfish nature of the id. Okay? So now, in Freudian thinking, what happens is he thinks that consciousness has these different levels. At the top, you see this is like an iceberg. Freud used the iceberg as his analogy because in, in an iceberg, only 10% of the iceberg is actually above the surface. And so the 10% that is above the surface is really consciousness. This is this is the part that we're truly aware of. But then what happens is here we have a pre-conscious. You see this little area that's just below the surface, and it's the area that could come to the surface and maybe could and maybe couldn't. And in a lot of ways, the ego is in charge of and responsible for which parts of pre-consciousness are in fact going to emerge into the consciousness. Meanwhile, below the level of the consciousness, below the level of the pre-consciousness, is the unconsciousness. And this unconsciousness, according to Freud, is the majority. The majority of what you are is the result of the unconsciousness. Okay? So what's happening is the ego's job is to regulate which things in the unconsciousness actually make it to the surface where we're aware of them. But what we're aware of is just a tiny little slice of what we are. Okay? And so um, what we find is that... Uh, in in yeah okay here so in in Freudian analysis or Freudian type thinking here's here's just an example let's say for example the id says I'm hungry I'm hungry I'm hungry give me food now I want now so the ego's you know the ego's job is to help to, to satisfy the id okay and so you know what happens is he says I want it you know and so somebody's ha holding a candy bar and the id's like just smash him in the face and take the candy bar but the superego jumps in and goes, no, 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 no. And so it's almost like that little analogy of an, a devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other shoulder, and the devil's going, do it, do it, do it. And the superego, the angel is saying, no, no, no. And the ego, the ego in the middle, I, I need to satisfy both the devil and the angel. I think I switched shoulders on them, huh? whatever. The devil and the angel need to be satisfied. So the ego goes, aha, I have it. I know what you can do. I'm going to walk to the vending machine, put in a dollar, and buy a candy bar. So now the superego is satisfied because you satisfied the social demands. The id is satisfied because the id has gotten its candy bar. The ego says, problem solved. Okay? So the ego's job is to satisfy the demands of the id while, while following the rules set by the superego. But there are certain situations in life where this can't work. And I'll give you a good example, and then we're going to come up to it in, in, in another couple of slides. But one of, the, one of the desires that the id has, according to Sigmund Freud, who was a pervert, that... Boys, when they're about four years old, develop a desire for mom. And when I say desire, I mean desire. 
okay? And so what happens is the id is saying, I want it. And the superego is like, dude, are you kidding me? That ain't right, okay? And so the ego is sitting here going, oh, shit, how am I going to solve this, all right? I've got the id saying, give me. The superego saying, there ain't no way. There's no compromise here. The ego has no solution. So what does the ego do? The ego does the best thing it can do, and it represses it. Okay, it represses the id's desire. And so down there underneath the surface is that repressed desire from the id, right? So that's what's down there in the unconsciousness is these repressed desires, these things that the ego couldn't solve. And yet the id's desires have a lot of unconscious instinctive energy, and they're always pushing their way to the surface. And the ego's job is hold it down. Okay? So this is what's going on underneath the surface of the, the consciousness, according to Freud. Okay? And so what happens is um, when, you know, I, I, when, when the id wants something, the superego says no way, and the ego has no solution, then, as I said, the ego uses repression. Well, repression is one of the defense mechanisms. Sigmund Freud that there are, said that there are a whole bunch of different defense mechanisms or solutions that the ego might use to um, solve its problems. And so one example would be, you know, um, your boss yells at you and so your id wants to lash out at your boss and your seat where you go goes, no, stop, you know, you can't, you can't smack your boss in the face. And so the ego's got to deal with this. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And you get home and you kick the dog. Okay. Well, there you go. He calls that defense mechanism displacement. So there's a variety of defense mechanisms, but again, they're all sort of intent. They are all intent. They're all, they're all tools that the ego can use to satisfy this conflict between the id and the superego. But ultimately, they're all really a version of repression. So, you know, repression is the ultimate defense mechanism. But there's a huge long list of them that we're not going to get into. Well, I guess we are. Look at that. Rationalization, repression, projection, displacement, blah, 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 blah. But clearly, repression is really what they all are. They're all versions of repression. All right. So, Freud has this little in theory of development, how personality develops. And he says when, when, when children grow, they go through a series of psychosexual stages, okay? Psychosexual stages. And during these different stages, what happens is um, the id's impulsive needs are focused on particular elements, okay? And so during the first stage of life, the oral stage, the id's impulsive needs are focused on the nipple, on sucking, on food, consuming. Okay? During the second and third years of life, um, I, the anal stage, and, and what you find is, is very clearly at this stage, potty training becomes the fundamental important thing in the home. And according to Freud, that's because the id's unconscious energies, instinctive energies, are focused on this element. During the phallic stage, around age four, this is where uh, children become um, aware of the id's uh, sexual energies. And this is where, of course, we just said the Oedipal complex, where um, boys will desire their mothers. And uh, Oedipus, by the way, Oedipus Rex, or King Oedipus. Oedipus was a character in Greek mythology. And Oedipus um, didn't know who, he kills his own father, doesn't realize it's his father, and he marries his own mother, and so a little bit freaky. So anyway, Oedipal complex. And so according to Freud, what happens is that the id and the superego, right, the id says, I want it, the superego says, there's no way, and so the ego is just in this giant ball of conflict, and so at one point, what happens, do I have it on this slide? No. What happens is that um, the ego can solve this with what's called identification. And so you find children, especially boys around age four, will become almost like miniature versions of their father or, or adult role model in their life. And so they'll become miniature versions of that person. And what's happening is, according to Freud, 
Freud is full of shit. According to Freud, what's happening is that the, the four-year-old, the boy, will be saying, I want mom. Dad is a rival. Okay? He's the one that has her. And so, how can I get mom? Well, dad has her, and this is how dad behaves, so maybe I need to behave in these same ways. Okay, Freud is full of shit. But anyway, what we find is that after this phallic stage and a whole lot of confusion, children go through the latency stage. And in the latency stage, which is around 6 to puberty, that these... Um, <clears throat> the id's desires are now sort of dormant, okay? And so he goes through these things, but again, the whole point being that you as an adult, your personality, okay, is this. This is your personality. And so all of that crap that's going on below the surface is kind of you know, an unresolved conflict between the id and the superego about I want mama and, and it was never resolved and it was shoved down and ooh, but yet all of this crap that's going on down there isn't gone, right? It influences you even if you don't believe it. In fact, Sigmund Freud, one of the things that I thought was interesting about Freud was he said there was three great blows to the collective human ego. I like that. Three great blows. And he talked about um, Copernicus, because Copernicus was the guy that says, look, the Earth is not, in fact, the center of the universe. Oh, shit, right? We're not that special. And then along comes Darwin, and Darwin goes, human beings are just animals, dude. You're just steering nothing different between you and the other animals. Oh, crap. And then, according to Freud, he himself was the third great blow to the collective human ego, because according to him, he basically reveals to us that you think you're in charge, you think you have free will, you think you're, but you're not. You're being driven by all of these things that are down there below the level of your consciousness that you're not even aware of. All right. So Sigmund Freud um, was very influential. Um, he had a character, a personality that, that, that brought many followers. Okay? So some of his followers, some that, you know, that he felt were going to be his children, you know, the ones that were going to take to carry on his theory after his death were uh, Carl Jung and Alfred Adler, and he had some huge conflicts with both of them. Because both Jung and Adler took Freud's basic theory and tweaked it and modified it a little bit. And Freud did not like anybody messing with his theory, okay? He did not want anybody to change it. But Carl Jung basically said, okay, that stuff here that you're calling the consciousness right here, the, the unconscious rather, is just what now instead he calls it the personal unconscious. He says that's your unconscious. He says that personal unconsciousness is really quite small. Instead, there's also a reservoir called a collective unconsciousness or a reservoir of material which we all share with each other. And in fact, it was kind of interesting because Carl Jung actually did a little bit of anthropology work and he found that, you know, in different cultures, very, very similar myths, very, very similar, you know, folk stories. These things just arose independently, independently in all kinds of different cultures. And according to Jung, it's basically because all human beings are sharing this collective unconsciousness. And I like that idea, but I, I, I'm much more of a much more of a scientist. And so I'd be much more willing to talk instead of a collective unconsciousness, I'd be more willing to say, for example, say a shared genetic ancestry, but neither here nor there, right? Alfred Adler, now, um, again, Freud was obsessed with sex. And so he, um, oh, I'm, oh, so many obsessions. Well, it turns out that Alfred Adler had his own problems. When he was a child, he, uh, polio? I don't remember exactly, but he, he was handicapped in a way that he was clearly, uh, could not keep up with the other boys. He could not, you know, run with them, could not do the sports and athletics and stuff. And so he had feelings of inferiority. And so what happens is, according to Adler, you know, the, you know, growth or personality development is a struggle to over, overcome, oh, uh, get past these feelings of inferiority. Okay, so he took the same basic theory, but instead of, you know, these sexual stages, he kind of 
substituted in this notion of, of struggle to get past your feelings of inferiority. Psychodynamic perspectives. Well, it's interesting because they definitely added to our thinking that, you know, unconscious forces influence behavior, that, you know, things below, but outside of our recognition and understanding can control us. Um, this idea that even if we're not necessarily aware of that stuff going on down there, it can influence us. Um, definitely, it, it focused on the idea that experiences in childhood can influence so much about the adult, okay, things like this. But I, I'm a scientist, okay, I'm a, I'm a hardcore scientist. Freud's theories are shitty science, okay? I mean, they're not science. Don't even pretend they're shitty science. One of the reasons I got a problem with Freud is because so many people, you know, when you say psychology, people think Freud or something of that nature, and Freud was not a scientist. He was he was did shitty work, and I, I, I want to tell people I'm a scientist, and people don't think I'm a scientist because Freud's stuff was shit. Sorry, that's enough ass words. Move on. All right, let's move on to more of a behavioral perspective. Behavioral perspective. Now, this comes originally from Ivan Pavlov. Maybe you've heard about, you know, the bells, the dogs and the bells and the drooling. And I'm not going to go through that whole thing. But basically what happens, in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to flash forward. And Pavlov's basic work was hugely influential on John Watson, an American psychologist. And John Watson, basically, he was an empiricist, right? An empiricist, he thought empirically. And that is to say, he, he felt that everything you are is a product of what you've experienced, right? On the game of nature versus nurture, John Watson felt that uh, when you're born, you're born with very, very, very little. And what you are as an adult is a product of the experiences you've had. Okay, and so according to John Watson, um, when a baby is born, they just have a few reflex reflexes, very instinctive things. And so he broke it down into fear, rage, and love. He said an infant, um, if if you if you expose an infant to very loud sounds, the infant will will experience fear. If you uh, constrict the movement of an infant, you'll trigger rage. And if you pat and stroke the infant, you'll um, trigger love. So these are three reflexive emotional states that infants are born with. Okay, you, They don't have to learn these three things. They just are born that way. However, after that, everything you become, because you as an adult are an incredibly complex organism, right? I mean, your personality is so much. But according to Watson, you're fundamentally at the core nothing but fear, rage, and love combined with the laws of association. So let's check this out. Here's what he did in, in, in one study. He, he got a baby, baby Albert. Okay, a little baby Albert, poor baby. And so what happens is little baby Albert is just sitting in the lab, you know, sitting there. And John Watson sneaks up behind him with a big hammer and a big metal bar. Okay? And he sneaks up behind him, and he's holding the metal bar, and he hits it with a hammer, dong, really loud. Baby Oliver, bleh, screams. Okay, so that's the top part of this image here. An unconditioned stimulus, or unlearned. An unlearned thing is a loud noise leads to an unlearned response, fear. Okay, and so according to, you know, uh, John Watson, this top connection here, this association is, is natural, it's reflective. So then, what he does is he brings out a little white rat, okay? See the little rat there? And brings it out in Albert. Oh, that enjoys playing with the rat. It's so cute. I love it. And then he sneaks up behind him. Dong! And Albert starts screaming, not because of the rat, but because of the loud sound. Now, if you do this about five, ten times, once you bring the rabbit or the rat out, Albert screams. Why? Because Albert has come to associate the rat with a loud sound. It was a loud sound that triggered the fear originally, but now it is the rat that triggers the fear. And so all of a sudden, taking just these three very basic fear, rage, and, wait, yeah, fear, rage, and love, 
and combining it with a simple experience, you've now made a much more complex little baby here. Now, taking these principles even further, it turned out that not only did the rat lead to fear, but if you bring out a rabbit, it led to fear, right? Because it's white and furry. And heck, Albert's mom comes to pick him up, and he, Albert's like, no. Why? Because mom has a fur collar on her coat, right? Mom takes the coat off, and baby's fine. Heck, baby Albert was even afraid of Santa Claus because there's a white beard. And so all of a sudden, we find the very simple fear, rage, and love combined with experiences across a lifetime creates a very complex organism. <coughs> organism. Hmm. B.F. Skinner takes it a little bit further and says, uh, because in, in uh, Watson's view there, this is all involuntary stuff. It's just, uh, nah, no, I don't want to say that. But anyway, um, B.F. Skinner takes this perspective a little bit further and um, says, and again, keep in mind that personality, understanding of personality is all about predicting human behavior, right? That uh, if, it's, if a person is, uh, what did we say, extroverted, then we predict that they'll talk when they go to a party or something like that. So keeping that thought in mind, that's uh, where this is coming in, is that B.F. Skinner's perspective is that uh, these experiences that you have are really, the behaviors that you exhibit are a product of the experiences that you have. And so if, say for example, um, going back to the extroversion and talking at a party, if um, you, uh, you go to a party and you begin talking and you're rewarded for it, that is to say uh, you, you talk and somebody said, hey, I liked what you're saying or smiled at you. That's positive reinforcement. And so what's going to happen is that all of a sudden the frequency of this talking at parties behaviors goes up. And so personality is nothing but a combination of the behaviors that you've exhibited across your lifetime. And so according to um, uh, B.F. Skinner's perspective, that your, your complex personality really comes from these experiences of reinforcement and punishment for particular behaviors that you've exhibited. Albert Bandura took it a little bit further and said, all right, it's not just your direct experiences and the rewards and punishments that you have been given, but it also includes the rewards and punishments for behaviors that you've seen. Okay, So in a very classic study, um, Albert Bandura, they call this a Bobo doll study, and so what happens is you can see in the top four frames there. So there's a woman, she goes into a room and in it there's this Bobo doll. See, it's an inflatable doll. You blow it up. I don't know if your generation had these. And what happens is in the bottom there's like sand. And so when you punch it, it comes right back up. Okay. So what happens now, it's, it's got a clown face on it. Yeah brings up some fear memories. And so what happens is in this video, you see what happens. A woman is sitting on it and punching it in the nose. She's throwing it. She's hitting it with a hammer. She's kicking it, etc. Then they took some kids in and um, they, they frustrated the kids. They put them in a room with also some really good, oh, they, they, by the way, the children watched this video first, the video of the woman, okay. Then they put them in a room full of toys that were excellent toys, and they were in there for about five minutes, and then they said, oh, no, 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 no. We need to get these toys. We need to save them for somebody else. You go to this other room, and it's filled with crappy toys, right? So now the kids are annoyed. They're frustrated. And one of the toys in this new room is a boba doll. What are the kids going to do? And lo and behold, they do the exact same thing. Okay, They imitate her. Um, clearly, they have picked up in many kinds of ways, just like B.F. Skinner said here, the experiences you have and the reinforcement and punishment you have. Bandura said it goes one step further. It's the rewards and punishments you see in others around you. So the behavioral perspective... Um, is really quite, yes, rooted in empirical research. Real research studies have, have backed this stuff up. And it's it's quite an interesting idea. Personality and situational factors create behavior. Um, however, yeah, look at here the criticisms. They neglect cognitions. And they don't totally neglect cognitions, but 
they almost, yes, the behavioral perspective, if taken rigidly, um, treats a human being as an automaton. Okay, But clearly humans are not automatons. They do have cognitive processes that are going on in the same way. So I, I'm a behaviorist. I don't know. I like it myself. A uh, very radically different perspective is the um, humanistic perspective. And this would be Abraham Maslow to begin with. And Maslow basically says um, who you are, what you do, really is driven by this notion of um, this hierarchy of needs. And so what you find here is that humans are driven. There, my head is out. So humans are driven to, to satisfy their needs. Ultimately, all human beings are driven by the need for self-actualization. They're driven by the need to find your purpose in life. In fact, I'm going to sort of merge together the notion from Carl Rogers. It goes like this. Um, imagine that, that human beings, when they're born, they're like an acorn. Okay? An acorn has a purpose, right? An acorn's purpose is to become an oak tree. You got that? And so what happens is, according to Abraham Maslow, your entire life will be an attempt to become an oak tree, to become your purpose. Now, of course, each and every one of you has your own purpose, but to fulfill your purpose, to self-actualize is the word he uses for this. And so in order to self-actualize or fulfill your purpose, you must satisfy many, many, many things to get there, okay? And so, number one, if you want to satisfy your purpose, you know, your purpose in life, you must satisfy your physiological needs, okay? And so, let's say you have a purpose in life, a meaning, a, a reason for existence, but you don't have enough food. What's more important, your meaning in life or finding food to survive today? And it's like pretty straightforward, finding food to survive, okay? And so, as you move your way up to higher level needs, you must satisfy everything below before you can move your way up to the next one. And so it's an interesting idea because Carl Rogers took it a little bit further and he talks about, again, this acorn analogy. And he says everybody's born an acorn, wants to be an oak tree. But what happens is sometimes if you take an acorn and throw it into, let's say, a parking lot, you're not going to get much growth out of that acorn, okay? You're going to get nothing. Take that acorn and throw it up into a field of um, gravel. Are you going to get a tree? I don't know. You might get a twig or a sprout or something, but I don't know. Throw it into really good earthy soil with lots of stuff. I don't know. Fertilizer. Fertilizer. <laughs> and ba-boom, the acorn becomes an oak. And so according to Carl Rogers, this is, this is kind of the idea is that People strive to become an oak tree, but the world that they are exposed to limits their ability to get there. Okay? And so, according to um, Rogers, what happens in, in, in his theory is that people have what's called a self-concept. They have a collection of ideas. In fact, a collection of who am I? What am I? They have, in fact, uh, in, in a different conception here, not written here, Rogers says that people have an actual self and an ideal self. That is, um, who am I in reality? Who do I want to be? And so when we feel this feeling of incongruence is when we do not develop. Um, humanistic perspectives. And, and again, they are not science, period. At least, however, unlike Freud, the humanistic psychologists admit that they're not science. Okay, they at least say oh, we're not science. I don't know why you bring them. We're not. Okay, but we find that the humanistic perspective is actually important because it emphasizes the idea that personality doesn't need to be stuck in the past. That personality is not fixed. That the whole point of life and personality is, in fact, growth, continual growth throughout the lifetime. Um, Hans Ising, Hans and Sybil actually, husband and wife, Hans and Sybil Ising, they had an interesting perspective on personality that says personality is shaped by genetics, okay? That the person you are is fundamentally at its core, not just the products of the experiences of your lifetime, 
But and we said it in the last topic. Some people are just born happier than other people, right? It's just that's who they are. And so, according to Isink's using twin studies, right? They looked at identical twins and found that the personality structure of identical twins was very, very similar, much more so than the personality structures of fraternal twins. And they found that um, there's a lot of heritability. That is that there's much of personality is based on genetics. Huh? Another biological perspective is more of an evolutionary perspective which is to say personality is nothing more than um, a pattern of, a, well, again, remember, adjusting or adapting. That is, it is personality is uh, things that have allowed us to adapt to our environment, something of that nature. It's a pretty powerful idea to think that all cognitive processes that we have, whether it be intelligence or personality or emotions, all of these things fundamentally have at their core the idea that they solved some adaptive purpose. They allowed a caveman to adjust to the, the demands of the caveman's world, okay? And so they fundamentally, what we're born with is, is that structure which was in fact adaptive to our, uh, our past, okay? Um, very powerful thing. Um, it, 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 very important because again, we talk about nature versus nurture in psychology is a very common question, and yet somehow so much of the discussion of personality somehow seems to have forgotten the nature side of it. Gordon Alport um, was an interesting person. He had he, he created what was called the trait perspective of personality. He went into the English dictionary and he found 18,000 words to describe people, you know, traits. And so what happens is that if you describe somebody, oh, you're happy, right? No, that's not enough, he says, because any one trait doesn't do a good job of predicting human behavior. Instead, what happens is Alport's work was actually um, formalized by Myers and Briggs. I forgot who these two were, but I forgot their names. But the Myers-Briggs type indicator basically says on the trait perspective that all human beings are a combination of these four factors, these four uh, indicators or something, these four traits that we vary on extroversion, introversion, we vary on sensing intuition, we vary on thinking and feeling, we vary on judging and perceiving. Um, and so what happens is that all human beings can be a combination of basically I got real problems with the Myers Briggs. I'll just I'll try to give it to you, the idea to you. Um, according to Myers Briggs, all human beings fall into one of sixteen categories. All right, because you can be extroverted, sensing, thinking, judging, or you can be extroverted, sensing, feeling, judging, or you can be. And so imagine every possible combination of these pairs. Okay, and so everybody falls into one of these two two letter categories, as as what they call them. And when what when you take the Myers Briggs and identify, or no, four letter categories. When you identify your four letter category, then it allows you to understand many things about your strengths and weaknesses and what you will excel at and not excel at. And so the Myers Briggs, it's got limited usefulness, okay, limited usefulness, but the problem is, is the Myers-Briggs has been picked up by a lot of people that do not have any training, it's being used for job selection, for example, you know, there's this, un, this mistaken belief that, oh, if somebody has this four-letter code, then they'll be good for this kind of an occupation or something, and I don't know about that, that's probably a load of shit, um, Oh, 